So that's what I said. Technically, I'm not the managing broker. My corporation or LLC is, and they said, Raymond, you act for us because they can't walk and talk and sign documents. All right. So if I moved out of state, my corporation would just name another person. Sarah, you're getting ready to push the button. What do you want? Oh, thought you're pushing the speaker button. I was, it was breaking up for me, but I have, it's my network connection. I, yeah, so I'm good. All right. Uh, number five, independent contractor agreement. By rule, you guys are an independent contractor of me. There's the rule. Oh, number six, right here. We can talk about it now, go more in depth. I didn't want to get into it, but it's right here. So in the death of a, in the event of a death by a managing broker, all of you guys that now work for me, let's make this scenario. You guys all are my agents. Every one of you have two or three listings. If I die as the managing broker, all of those listings go away. Remember, death terminates listings. We talked about one of the seven ways to terminate a listing. And I told you it was death of either party. And at that time, I told you it was death of me or the client because I didn't want to get into the managing broker thing yet. But now you're going to see what's happening. So if it's an individual who is not a corporation and they die, all of the listings go away. All of the stuff that you have pended, you have 90 days to close. All right, so let's go through an example. Let's say you got your mom's house, it was listed, we got an offer, we accepted the offer, the property became pended. You then listed your mom's neighbor's house, which is listed. I now have a car accident and am killed. Your neighbor's listing would terminate immediately. But because your mother's deal is already pended, you can close that deal in the name of the Modulin Group and you have to do it in the next 90 days. During that period, you could create your own trust account if you wanted to but you cannot do any new business because your license was attached to mine and I died, you're going to have to go out and get a new managing broker. So your neighbor's listing that went away, you actually go to their house, take the modeling group sign, throw it in the trash because we're not gonna need that. But then you say, you know what? I just signed up with Remax. I now work for Remax. I will bring you back a new listing. We'll stick a new sign in the yard and you'll get a new listing under a Remax because I work for them now. So you can't do new business until you re-up with somebody. You can start your own business if you're qualified if you've done two years of active duty and you've done your 24 hour course, you can say, well, I'm not gonna go work for anybody. I'm just gonna start Sarah's real estate and start my own company. Same thing would be true though. You would go to your neighbor's listing, take the sign out, throw it away, put Sarah's real estate and it would be your own company. All right. Letter E says the best part of the whole thing. Letter E says that if I die, I still get my split. If we're on a 50-50 split, you don't get to go, uh, Raymond's dead, he doesn't need his money. No, I still get my split because it goes to my estate, all right? So you see all of these problems that can be created? 
So now, Lasana, let's pick up that conversation. So what happens now is when I go down to the commission to get my managing broker's license, they usually ask, are you going to hold other people's license? Yes, I am. Then we strongly suggest you go start a corporation and an LLC or a partnership, and we will give you that license. Of course, I have to pay for it so that none of this ever happens. So they give the managing broker's license to the Real Estate Monkey LLC. That LLC names Raymond to act like the managing broker and sign all the documents. But now if I die, did the managing broker die? The answer is no, the corporation didn't die. So none of the listings go away. You don't have to go start your own company. You don't have to sign up with someone else. You would literally say, oh, that's a shame Raymond died. Now it's Ian in place. And now you just keep going on about your business. Only Ian's now acting and walking and talking like the uh, managing broker, but it's still the real estate monkey. That's why we did this. So none of these things can ever happen, but those laws are in place. And I know for a fact, they love the 90 days. They love that question. You get to work for 90 days. Now, <clears throat> I told you earlier, jokingly, and we'll get to it, that you can only work for one Indiana broker at a time. That's a real law. This is a loophole to that law. If I truly did die and it was an individual with no corporation and the listings went away, but your mom's house was pended and you went and joined Remax, you literally would still close your mom's house in the name of the modeling group and the check would come in the name of the modeling group because that's where it was when it pended, even though you just signed a new listing under Remax. So technically, in that one scenario, should it ever happen, you actually could be working for two for at least 90 days. You would finish closing the stuff that you did, but the new stuff would be your new brokerage. All right, thumbs up. All right, let's talk a little bit about the recovery fund. Now, in your book, letter E, the recovery fund, goes through 14 numbers. I'm going to do this differently because I think I do a much better job than the book does. So I'm going to cover these in a better fashion. It seems more logical to me. So the real estate recovery fund, first of all, there are two things that have to happen before the recovery fund even can be in place. In the past, we have talked about no harm, no foul. And I told you that that's not necessarily true. In this particular case, it literally is true. For the recovery fund to even be considered, there has to be harm done. This is not a punitive damages kind of thing. You guys remember what punitive damages mean? Punitive damages mean penalty or punishment. That's not what this is talking about. The recovery fund deals with actual financial harm. The client lost earnest money. The client's earnest money was stolen. They're out $5,000. There is actual harm in there. This is not, hey, Ross did a bad job, I want him punished. No, that's not what this is. That would be a punitive situation, all right? Not you, Ross, different Ross, you never do a bad job, all right? So this actually has to have harm. And the second thing is, the person who did the bad thing, they actually have to be a licensed realtor. 
They cannot be a scam artist that they told you they were licensed. They couldn't have conned you into believing they were licensed. Those aren't our guys. We don't care. So for the recovery fund to even take place, there actually has to be harm. And the person who did the bad thing actually has to be licensed. That's the only two things that are required. Now, here's how it works. In this recovery fund, we have $600,000. It is stored with the treasurer of the state of Indiana. We still control the purse strings, but it's in their bank. If there is a payout because someone made a claim and the commission paid them the claim, and this goes below $450,000, they will seek to replenish this money. Guess who they will seek to get it from? Lashana, your both your fingers were pointing in one direction. They should point in both directions. They are going to everybody that's licensed to recover the money. So people that are actively licensed, like me, and people that are newly licensed in that year, like you guys. So if there was a payout this year, <clears throat> they would seek money from me and you when you make your application. And we literally are our brother's keeper in this particular situation. One of our fellow brethren who was licensed did something wrong and caused the commission to have to pay a fee to a client we potentially will have to cover that. And they literally would go, oh, 150,000, there's 75,000 of us, everybody give me $2. And that's how they get it back up to 600,000. Now, when they tell us to give them money, this is over and above our license fee so our license is 60 bucks we would actually be charged 62 dollars this year 60 of it going for the license and the two dollars going back into the recovery fund so it is a fee to us over the top or on top of our license fee now, if it is in the bank, it accrues interest, right? So if it goes up to 750,000, now those numbers should be easy to remember because it's the same number either direction, plus or minus 150 grand. If it goes up to 750,000, guess what they do with the surplus? I love it when you your first thought in your head, and I know every one of you did it, was you get a refund. No, the state never comes off of money. <laughs> All right, you we do not get money back. They actually sweep it over into the general fund that we talked about, and then the general fund would use it to pay the real estate commission their per diem, pay the travel, they could pay continuing ed, they could do advertising about the industry, all of that. But we do not get money, okay? So now when they pay out, they pay out in like an insurance policy. They pay out, $20,000 maximum per incident. 20,000 maximum per incident. And 
50,000 maximum per lifetime of that agent. So it looks like an insurance policy, 20,000 per incident, 5,000 per lifetime. Guaranteed, bet my firstborn, that's a question on the state exam. It's 20,000 per incident, 50,000 per lifetime. So real quick, if the first person gets 20 grand and he steals money from a second person, they get 20 grand and he steals 20 grand from the third person, how much do they get? 10, because 50 is the max they're gonna pay on that guy. If he steals 25,000 in earnest money from a person, how much do they get? 20, because 20 is the maximum per incident. All right? Now, if he steals 16, they're only gonna give him 16. And typically the harm that I'm talking about, let's go ahead and get blunt. This is a managing broker stealing the earnest money and going away. Believe it or not, it's happened four or five times. There was a guy, the last guy that I remember, his name was Randy Keys here in Indianapolis. Stole all the earnest money out of the earnest money account. Realize that earnest money accounts can grow very big if you have a lot of agents. I mean, if you've got like sheets, two or 300 agents, and each one's putting 500, 1,000, 5,000 in, you could have three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 in your earnest money account. All right. So it has happened. And literally, this is the reason. So this is the cure it's 20,000 per incident and 50,000 per lifetime. Now, what they would do or what they can do is this. Let's say they stole 25 and this guy stole, lost 20 and this guy lost uh, 22. That's really gonna be stupid, hard numbers. I don't know. They would pay him 20, they would pay him 20, and then him 10, that's 50. That doesn't seem very fair, does it? That the one guy lost 20, but only got 10 back. What they can do is they can prorate this and say, okay, 25 out of 65 is some percentage, so he's going to get 17 back he's going to get like 15 back and he may end up getting 15 back as well i made those numbers up because i didn't want to do the math so this is called the pro rate aversion where they would simply divide it and see who that way everybody gets a little fair yes he lost a large number but he got more towards what he should have gotten and the commission can decide how to pay it off any way they want. All right. How did I do that a minute ago? That seems pretty cool. Now, when they pay out, they only pay out twice a year. They pay out on June the 30th and they pay out on December 31st. Why do you think those two dates? First half of the year, second half of the year. This allows for if a broker steals money and somebody files a suit, they could file here and here and here and all be considered one lawsuit because it's all in the first half of the money. You know, you may not realize your money was stolen until March. I may not until April, and Shauna didn't realize it until May. So because those are all in the first half of the year, they would put those together into one lawsuit, and they would do that math division that we just talked about. So they only write the checks twice a year, June the 30th, December 31st. And that is one because they only want to write checks twice a year, but that allows people 
to get grouped together. All right. Now there are time limits as to which you can make a claim. You have to make a, oh, well, let's talk about before that. This is not the first step in the scenario. This is the last step in the scenario. The real estate recovery fund is not first, meaning if a, man if a managing broker stole my earnest money, I don't go to the commission and say, pay me back. No, I actually have to prove he stole my money. And how do you prove someone stole your money? You have to go to court. So I literally have to go to court first and get the judge to say, yes, that guy stole your money and convict him of that crime before first. And then I have to try and collect my money from that managing broker. If that doesn't happen, then I can come to the commission. But it makes sense if you think about it. Remember, we're innocent until proven guilty. So if he stole my money, literally, I think he stole my money. Judge hadn't said he had yet. So I got to go to the court first, get the judge to give me the award, try and collect the award. If I can't, then I go to the commission and get paid. I see deer in the headlight looks. Are we okay so far? And because of that, there are time frames. We have time frames. So you have one year to file a judgment from whatever the date of the crime happened. And then you have one year to make application to the commission after the judgment to get the award. So it is time sensitive. It is time sensitive. You can't wait forever. They have to try and collect from the guy that stole it. So if that all happens and they come to the commission and they make a claim, and like I said, the reason they do this for these two half of years is so that if multiple people come, you know, Shauna got court two days ahead of me. I want to make sure that I still get my money. So they group us all together in this part of the year so that we can uh, all be grouped together. Now, they pay out and then they do what I told you. They send us money. And they say, okay, we had to pay out $3,000 this year. So everybody give us $2 and we will replenish the money. Guess what they're going to do to that dude's license? They are not going to do what you think they're going to do. They are only going to suspend it. They are not going to revoke it. Why do you think they want to keep him in suspension rather than revoking his license? Money. They just money All right, Christina. Because they can still collect money from him. Exactly. Yeah. I'm sure that's what Shauna was going to say, I think, because I heard her, come, heard her say that. If they revoke his license and kick him out, they are never going to collect from him. They want to suspend it so that he has a chance to pay the money back and he pays 12% interest. And when he pays it back, then he can get his license reinstated and practice again. All right. So they don't want to revoke it and get rid of him because he'll say, well, 
if I've got no chance of ever getting my license back, why go back? But here is the super big kick in the ding ding. And I've said that before, but here is the ultimate one. Guess what happens also? His managing broker's license gets suspended. So if it were you, they would suspend your license until you pay it back. They also would suspend my license till it gets paid back. So guess who's gonna cover it? Probably me, because I've got all these other agents that we're responsible for. I've got all these listings. So not only do they suspend the person's license, they suspend his managing broker's license until it gets repaid. Yes. So at that point, after you repay it, do you void your contract with that broker? Oh, probably. Yeah, I probably okay. did that long. Okay. Probably did that long before then. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He can be licensed somewhere else. He can so does someone? Does someone have to step in to be the like the managing broker or whatever uh, until you get your license back? Yeah, in theory, if we were a corporation or an LLC or or one of those, yes, I would have to step down. And depending on what we were, if we were like a partnership, remember I just told you if one of them does, they all do. If we were a partnership, we'd be screwed because now one of us lost our license. In a member managed, all of us have to. So I would step down and let someone else come in. That would be the only way because if I was an individual broker, meaning I'm not working as a corporation, I'm working as a sole proprietor, then it would, yeah, I'd lose my license, all the listings would go away, all of that. I literally know a managing broker who wrote a $5,000 check to a client to avoid all of this. The client said that their agent stole her earnest money, conned her into writing the check to him directly rather than to the company, and took the earnest money and left. And the broker said, how much was it? She said like five grand. He literally wrote her a check for 5,000 and handed it to her because he knew in the long run, he would probably end up having to pay for it. At least this way, they avoided all of that headache. Now I know that he tried to file a lawsuit against his agent, but his agent split left to uh, Texas. And I've seen this agent's website on Texas now still brokering real estate down there. All right. 